Hey everybody, Matt Colville here. Welcome to the command center for the Starship MCDM Productions. You can see one of the control panels that we use to run the ship blinking away behind me. And apparently, according to our warp drive readout, all systems are nominal. This is the first campaign diary. This is something we do after we run D&D, where I just talk to you folks about what happened last night and how the game went. You can watch the entire game now live on YouTube or on Twitch. I believe it's in 4K on YouTube. I'm not going to bring you all up to speed on everything that happened before tonight. There's a link in the doobly-doo to a web page that has all the handouts and everything, so you'll be able to get sort of caught up. Although, ultimately, this is a campaign that basically begins right after the end of my last campaign, some of which is on YouTube, the finale of which is on YouTube, so you can watch that. And it's really kind of impossible to get you caught up on literally every little detail of my campaign setting. The players had made characters, but each player did not know who the other players were playing. So these are, these are heroes that are the senior officers officers of the chain of Acheron. They all know each other and the players all know each other, but the and the, each player knows who they are playing, but each player doesn't know who the other players are playing. That was something I thought would be fun since I knew we were going to stream it and you folks were going to get to see this for the first time. I thought it would be fun if that was also the first time that the players got to see their other characters. But there is sort of an exception to this. Lars did not know who Phil was playing and Phil didn't know who Lars was playing, but Lars and Phil knew that they were the captain and the lieutenant respectively because I went and talked to them. I had identified them early on. I knew that the chain needed a command structure, and we'll talk about what that means because uh, it became relevant in the game toward the end uh, when we get there, but I wanted, I just thought about the different players and my history with them and their history with me and their history with D&D and their personalities, and so I identified Phil and Lars as being the two who would probably want to be either the person in charge or their second in command, and I just talked to them and they both agreed. This is the kind of thing you can do when you know your players really well, and that's kind of the theme of this entire session, by the way, is none of the other players batted an eye at the idea that they weren't even in the running to be the commander or the lieutenant of the chain. 6.15 rolls around, the players start showing up, and I grab Phil and Lars and bring them into my office here, and that's where the campaign started. It started here in my office as their characters, the commander and the lieutenant, lieutenant suite. Nobody really calls the commander anything else other than the commander, and that's also typically true of the lieutenant, but all these officers all remember before the lieutenant was the lieutenant, and he was just sweet. These are just nicknames, by the way. That's not his real name. So Lars and Phil are here in my office, and we start the process of playing D&D. They get to meet in a group graveyard in the city of Black Bottom, which uh, they knew they were going to be starting in because the handout said that the next mission was going to be in Black Bottom. Black Bottom is a port city and a pretty big one in my medieval European analog of Vasloria. They meet Lady Serial, Duke Kenway, and Baron Nicodemus, who are all NPCs that used to be PCs under the control of my friends Jess and Aaron and EJ, respectively. Phil and Lars know who those characters are, have met those players before, or those NPCs before, or both, but their characters don't. So they're role-playing these, these characters, the commander and the lieutenant, who don't know who this vampire lady is, and she's meeting them in a graveyard at midnight, and she tells them that at 6 o'clock in the morning, in 6 hours, Ajax's wizard Mortem is going to come out of the church of St. Clement the Journeyman. He's there now meeting with the bishop. She is hiring them. Technically, according to the contract, it's Kenway that's hiring them because she's a vampire queen, and I don't think that she can be the signatory to a contract. She is hiring them to assassinate Ajax's wizard Mortem. That is the setup for the first mission, for the first session, and for the campaign as a whole, which is called the final contract. And the players know this. They've known this for a long time. When they chose this campaign of the of four campaigns I put in front of them, when they chose the chain, it said in the description that the game begins with the chain suffering a massive defeat and having to retreat to capital to lick its wounds. And I told them, you're going to play through that massive defeat. And they were all like, oh, great. That means we're all going to die. And I was like, well, not all of you. you know, and so the players, especially Phil and Lars, knew that death was on the table. And that's going to play out over the course of the session. But this is why. They're supposed to assassinate Mortem, Ajax's wizard. Mortem is a very high-level wizard and largely responsible for Ajax's success. Serial believes, and she is correct, that if you can kill Mortem, you deal a serious blow to Ajax's war machine. It was Mortem who created the war breed, the half-orcs that defeated Good King Omen's dragonborn knights in combat. It was Mortem who raised the sky elf citadel that Ajax uses as his base, and it gives him this huge tactical advantage. So the players are down for this. Phil and Lars, it didn't occur to them to once say, no, we're not going to do it, because not only did they know what the setup of the game was, they thought that sounded good to them. Yeah, absolutely. Let's kill Mortem. 
if we can. But they had some questions and there were some things they didn't ask. Like they never asked. The players never asked. Hey, uh, he's there now. If it's midnight and he's in there now in this church, could we sneak in there? I sort of thought that the church they would understand. And I did explain that the church is kind of neutral ground because St. Clement the Journeyman is a saint of a neutral God. And they never asked, you know, could we infiltrate the church? Could we assassinate him now in the middle of the meeting? I said, when the when six o'clock happens, when dawn happens, the bells will ring for the first service of the church. And that will be the conclusion of the meeting that he's having with the bishop. And they will both walk out of the doors of the church. And that is your opportunity to kill this guy. And they're like, okay, but how do we do it? What we don't, we're not, we're fifth level. We're the heads of a mercenary company, but you know, 98% of the people in that mercenary company are like first level characters. We're in charge, but we're only fifth level. What are we supposed to do? And that's when Lady Serial gives them the five red arrows. And the red arrows pierce all wards, she describes. Now, I haven't done a lot of mechanical research into what these wards are. I just assume that if you're a high enough level wizard, and I know other editions have had these mechanics, you can cast spells that have contingency on them, right? That make it so that if something happens, even if I'm not paying attention, if something bad happens to me, this spell will automatically fire and this defensive effect will happen. So the players understand that. And the red arrows will pierce all such wards, she says, and they believe that. They didn't question that. She did describe that they are made of the same metal and forged in the same fire as the teeth of the dragon, which are these famous artifacts they have already encountered as players, not as characters. So they accepted that the red arrows would work, and I gave them five on purpose because I wanted them to have, no matter how many shots they took, even if they took two shots or three shots, that by the end of the battle, they would still have a couple of red arrows left for the future. It also gave me the opportunity to give the Count of Ren, uh, my friend EJ's character, this great line of dialogue where he says that five arrows is a waste of four arrows because you'll only get one shot. So everything's going great in this encounter. They're asking Lady Serial what her motivation is, and she describes how she's an enemy of Ajax. Ajax made her father kneel. Her father is the Lord of the Elves and now serves Ajax. And now that she's an undead vampire queen, she can do something about that. She's much more powerful now than she was when she was a mortal. But then the players asked a question I didn't even hadn't even thought of. They were like, why don't you take care of this then? And I was like, oh, that's a good question. But I did what I fell back on a technique I've used before, which is pretty successful. And that is, I just have Lady Serial say nothing and act mysterious as though she knows things the players don't. And that causes the players' wheels to start spinning in their minds. And then they come up with their own explanations for why it would be a bad idea. You know, it, they need plausible deniability is what Phil said. They need, they need people who are expendable is what Lars said in this room, in this meeting. And I was like, oh yeah, that sounds good. So I hadn't, I didn't have, uh, uh, you know, Duke Kenway or Lady Serial confirm that, but by not confirming it, not contradicting it, it sort of did confirm it. And so even though I had never thought of them asking that question, I did never think of why doesn't Lady Serial do this when they asked the question and I kind of bluffed and had Lady Serial act mysterious, they came up with their own answer, which I then sort of allowed them to confirm. Silence. Silence is a very a thoughtful silence, I should say, is a very uh, powerful tool in the DM's toolbox. So that's the setup, and then we all went into the uh, into this onto the set. We have our own set now. We went to the table and we started playing. We played for, I don't know what the actual play time would be between all the table talk and everything, but it was probably about three hours, which I think was about right. And they got about as far as I thought they would. There were a couple of dramatic beats that I thought that I'd sort of set up as being good stopping points and they got to one of them. So in general, I was very happy with the way the session went, by the way. This is the first time maybe ever that in my history of running D&D where I had a really cool idea for a new campaign that required a lot of setup and I actually ran the first session and didn't forget anything. It's super typical for me. I think literally every time I've ever tried to launch a new campaign and I had a whole bunch of beats that I wanted to hit in the beginning to set up things dramatically, set things up dramatically, I always forget something. And then afterwards I'm like, oh, there was a super important plot point I didn't set up. But actually I just, instead of writing a typical uh, adventure prep document, which I do in Word and uses a lot of English, I just used Excel and I basically made it bullet points. You know, I went point by point by point and that made it like a checklist and that made it a lot easier for me to organize the process. This is not something I would do in a normal session, but this was not a normal session. This was highly linear and in the opening, very cinematic. The players knew that their characters were going to have ranks or titles and I had done, a, I created a word doc where I listed a whole bunch of them. I wanted to make sure there were way more ranks and titles than there were players so they wouldn't feel like, well, there's five of us and there's five ranks. We each have to pick one and then someone gets stuck with one. That's an important design principle is you always want to give your players more options than there are players so people don't feel like they're being stuck with something. 
And I had mechanical benefits assigned to each of these, but they were very first drafty. What you folks saw watching the live stream was basically the second draft with one exception. And so they had all picked titles. And I told them, listen, there's a title and the mechanic, but this mechanic is subject to change. It's mostly just to express to you what I consider the mechanical flavor of this role. Let's call them role cards. I think a lot of you folks know that I don't use feats in my game. I think feats focus players on the wrong kind of choices. And there's already, even without feats, they are optional, by the way. Even without feats, there's more character options than you could ever exhaust in a lifetime of play. And I've never had two people at the table in any of my games feel like, well, we're both playing identical characters. I wish Matt let us use feats to differentiate ourselves. And I was pretty happy with how the titles worked, by the way. I was happy with the Weapon Master because we got to see somebody roll damage and they got to turn a one into a two. That's a very useful and frequent ability that is not really that overpowering. You're just changing a couple of ones and damage to twos. That's it. Makes the player feel useful, is useful, but isn't overwhelming. I was happy with the lieutenant. The lieutenant in a combat, when this you only do this once per day, but often there's probably only gonna be one combat per day, can switch the initiative. After everybody rolls initiative, can switch the initiative of two different players. That implies that he is the field commander. There's the, you know, there's the commander, but the lieutenant is the one in charge of how are we going to implement the commander's decision. So having him be kind of the tactical expert and being able to use his command authority, his experience, his tactical experience to switch people in combat was gonna be a huge benefit but ultimately those people could have rolled those initiatives anyway. You know, if they need copper, for instance, to go first, and I think this is a good example of that, and copper roll and Tom rolls badly, the lieutenant can switch them. And that's a cool ability and it makes Phil feel useful and it's got a lot of flavor to it. But at the end of the day, in that combat, they could have rolled those initiatives. So I'm not super worried about that breaking the game or anything. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. It worked once, and we'll see. I'm pretty happy with that. The Staff Sorcerer, I think, is going to be okay, but they, Tom didn't really get to use... Tom, not Tom. Didn't really get to use the Staff Sorcerer ability, and he's a new player. I think he's a little bit overwhelmed with all the options. The commander might be OP. Once per day, the commander can give somebody else in the chain a free uh, melee weapon attack. And this is kind of very warlordy. And so this went to Lars, who's also a battle master. And the battle master has a lot of warlord fourth edition. The warlord is a class from fourth edition that I quite like, giving him kind of warlordy ability. It's that notion of he commands, so he's the commander. He comm he issues a command. He I order you to attack that person. And if you follow orders, then you get this benefit of a free melee attack. A free melee attack is going to be useful for a lot of people, but there, it's very situational. So it may be OP, but I'm not super worried about it right now. The one thing I definitely think needs a buff is the standard bearer. The standard bearer's ability is if they go down in combat, the entire company, the entire group, all the heroes, all get a free reaction to use their movement. The idea being it's like, you know, if the goalie in hockey gets hit, all the other, if somebody wants to start a fight with a goalie, the entire team is going to come to his defense. And that notion that the standard, as Phil said, the standard cannot touch the ground. I like that idea. But the problem is my mechanics for that are the, it's the only one left from my first iteration of how these ranks and titles are going to work. And short of, it sort of shows, right? Because it's it, it's rare that it's ever going to happen. So Tom actually said after the game, I feel like everybody else's thing, they get to do that at least once per day per battle, but mine might never happen. And I was like, that is a super good point. We are going to fix it. And I just asked him, how would you like it if it worked, Tom? And he referenced something that happened in the game where he used Big Cat and had the standard and kind of rallied everybody and said, we're going down to the sewers, spoilers. And I was like, okay, well, I'll come up with something that makes it so you can use the standard to sort of rally everybody in combat or lead the way or something like that. We'll come up with something. They also had a list of magic items I created using the rules in Xanthar's Guide to Everything, perfectly normal, straightforward magic items, perfectly legal, randomly generated. And I and the players had only picked, I think, Phil, he's a pugilist, which is a custom class he found on uh, the DMs Guild. He's basically like an unarmed fighter, but not a monk, which he and I both quite like. He obviously wanted the belt of hill giant strength. That was a no brainer. And then, you know, other players were like, I'm sort of interested in this if no one else wants it. There was a lot of that. And I was like, that's fine. But now you have to decide. Now we're actually playing. I had sent this to them in email, but I was like, now we're actually playing. You have to decide, is this on someone's person or is this in party treasure? It's fine to leave it in party treasure, but that means that it's not going to be accessible while you're in the middle of combat. It's going to be in a lockbox somewhere back at your inn or tavern or whatever. So I put the Cathedral of St. Clement, the journeyman, on the table, and that was the sign that we were we were playing D&D, &D, and I described where they were. They were in Black Bottom and what time it was, and I said that there was this thick, heavy fog on the ground that's super important. 
I didn't want to press that button, you know, too often or ring that bell too loudly. I just wanted to say it and move on so that when later something interesting with the fog happened, they would just remember, yeah, there was fog on the ground. And then it was up to Phil and Lars to debrief the rest of the chain, which I thought went pretty well. They had some questions. You know, I, I made sure there were guards there. I started putting uh, people, you know, I don't have townsfolk. It's crazy. I, my miniature collection is large, but very random and not well organized and is, has huge holes in it, for instance. Like, I don't have a bunch of townsfolk or peasant miniatures, so I just use a bunch of guards. And, you know, I thought about doing a whole lot of really elaborate presentation because this is one of our, you know, depending on how you look at it, this stream is one of our premier products. And I did spend a lot of money on miniatures like the church. I spent a lot of money on to get painted from our friend Blues Light Painting. But that's pretty normal, actually, for me to take one or two or three miniatures and spend, especially bad guy miniatures, and spend a lot of money getting really cool bad guy miniatures because that impresses the players. And I could have done the same thing with all the terrain. I could have got city terrain, like streets is what I'm thinking of specifically. But I was like, no, I don't want this to turn into, you know, a high production TV show. I want to show everybody that this is still something apart from the expensive minis, something you can do at home. So I just use the normal. I think I get them from uh, gaming paper. There are these like uh, tactiles that you can you know put together and they're they're cheap. They're kind of disposable because, as I think we've learned, all of these things that we write on with uh, dry erase pens, uh, very quickly they accumulate a bunch of gunk and you're just going to throw them out anyway. So I use those tiles. I drew the streets on it. I drew where there was an apple cart seller, which was, I think, a great moment because it really took all. This is an important point, by the way, for Dungeon Masters. Oh, yeah, there's a town full of people. It's early morning, so there's not that many of them. They're kind of waiting for the early morning uh, vespers, you know, the ritual that happens at the church. And the apple cart seller, the apple cart and the apple cart seller becomes sort of a proxy for the entire town, for all the citizens. So, yeah, there's a whole bunch of nameless, faceless people milling around. But by giving one of them a job and a background, suddenly now there is a person that everybody, including all the people watching, but certainly all the characters at the table, can hang their interest on. I mean, how, how far into this video are we? And we've already had, I think, a couple of important DM lessons. I had assumed that the players would set up Copper and Big Cat, which is my friend Tom's ranger character, as the assassin. He is a great archer. If anybody can hit Mortem, it's going to be him. They're going to set him up on top of a building somewhere. And that was all the thinking I had done on it, by the way. I literally was just like, well, I'll draw some streets out. I didn't have a map. I didn't want to over-prepare. For once in my life, I didn't want to over-prepare. I wanted to trust my own ability to sort of improv from an outline. And I think that worked pretty well. You got to watch it happen live. I knew I was just going to draw some blocks, right? Well, it was showing like, here's this block, here's this block, and there, this therefore is an alley. And these are buildings. And then I made sure to kind of cross hatch them on the table so the players could tell the difference between this is a building, this is an alley. And that worked really well. But then the players started asking questions I didn't have answers to. But I, I left those things blank on purpose because I believed I would be able to come up with answers in the moment. And I was. They said, what kind of buildings are these? And I just said, oh, I figured, well, this is a, a church. It's a nice church. It's the last standing church in this entire half of the continent, by the way. And there's a backstory there we're not going to get into. But they, the players understand this. And we talk about it in the live stream. I said, well, this is a really nice, expensive church. So this are, these are probably this is probably a rich part of town, right? So this is the noble quarter. And I described Black Bottom as being the kind of city that in this part of the world is an amazing city. But for these people who have been to other planes, it's nothing. It's a backwater. And the largest, apart from this one stone cathedral, the largest building is probably like three stories tall. So these are two story tall and maybe three story tall noble houses. And the players got it. And they instantly start asking questions about are they flat topped? Are they, are they roofs like this? And I said, they're roofs like this. Because that's how I imagined it in my head. That's a bad answer for the players because if they're roofs like this, then you can put somebody on top of them with a bow and arrow. But roofs like this is basically impossible for somebody to stand on and be, be not seen by people in the street. But that was how I imagined it in my head, and I stuck with that. Even though I knew when I did it, I was going to be, be making it harder for them. But then they started saying, okay, well, are any of these buildings, it would be nice if we could get into one of these buildings. And so, because that way we could use a window or something. I started asking about where the windows were. And at that point, I'm like, okay, they're going to want to get into one of the buildings. Let me make it 
possible and plausible for them to try to get into one of these buildings. I had somebody make an insight check and I said, this one building here seems to, it's early in the morning, all the lights are going on in other, other buildings except this one. They're like, oh, maybe it's abandoned, right? So they break in, that was easy, and, and Phil, uh, the lieutenant, it's his job to figure out how are we gonna do this. That's the difference procedurally between the commander and the lieutenant. The commander decides, in this case, Lars, decides what jobs are we gonna take? Yeah, we'll take this job to kill Mortem. Then the lieutenant is in charge of figuring out how to do it. And I don't think, by the way, they were even role-playing those roles. I think that was just Lars and Phil just being Lars and Phil. Like, Phil was automatically like, okay, can we get into this building? Can we break into this building? I'm gonna break the lock. And they led Copper, who is a goblin ranger on Big Cat, his displacer beast, up to a balcony that I decided was there. And they're gonna hide behind the window with the window open so they can shoot Mortem. They can aim at him and shoot him when he comes out. So the players have a plan. They put their ranger with the red arrows. I think they gave the commander one red arrow just in case. They put Copper, the ranger, up in the noble house. He's going to be able to get a beat on Mortem when he comes out. The rest of the heroes are spread out amongst the slowly gathering town folk. This is the first time they played together. So I knew they were going to plan. I knew they were going to take a long time. This is the first time this group of players have ever played together. Specifically, Tom and Anna and Lars and Phil were all in the last game. So sort of they, we've all played together, but Tom is the new guy. So this is the first time all five of these players have gotten together. I sort of knew they would want to take a while to get to know each other and learn how are we going to be a mercenary company. But actually, I think they took to it really quickly. I was aware in the background, though, if they take too long and if they're planning too much and they're arguing too much, I'm just going to have the bells ring. That is such, I thought, a useful kind of uh, alarm. There's the clock is ticking, tick, 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 and an alarm is going to go off. And I have control over when that alarm goes off. So that gives me a mechanism with which I can stop all the kibitzing and say, now it is time to act. But I didn't really have to do that. They did kind of get their act together and they had a plan. They positioned their characters. The bell rings and Mortem and the bishop, Bishop Ives, walk out of the cathedral. It's initiative, and I believe the lieutenant used his ability to swap players' initiative so that Copper could go first. Copper is the one with the red arrows. He's the one that's going to take the shot at Mortem. I describe what Mortem looks like. He is, he is, and in fact, this is something that I improved. I don't think I knew what Mortem looked like before he walked out of that church and they asked. And I just described him as looking like a combination of sort of, I was imagining, a really well-tailored medieval person and sort of Ming the Merciless. He's got money. He cares about how he looks. There's a little bit of ostentatious, I'm a wizard, high collar, skull cap, but there's also a lot of fine clothing, I'm a noble person. I decided it was reasonable that Copper would have a readied action. So as soon as Mortem walks out of the cathedral, Copper can shoot him. And of course, the heroes have surprise. Mortem, as far as they know, is not expecting to be ambushed. But I couldn't remember exactly how surprised works. I was sitting behind the screen going, okay, I know that 5th edition, surprise. there's no such thing as a surprise round. It's just a condition. But I didn't know what the condition was. I couldn't remember it. And as I was trying to reverse engineer it in my head, I was like... Is it just that everybody has advantage attacking him and that he gets to act normally? Does he get to act with this? Does, do his attacks and stuff have disadvantage? And none of those answers sounded good to me, even though I'm sure one of them was probably right, because I am sort of cooling on advantage as being rolling 2d20, because it's just a, such a huge bonus, I think, mechanically, that I'm sort of trying to find ways to minimize it now in my game. I think there are some people watching in chat who are flabbergasted, which is a fantastic word, isn't it? Who are flabbergasted that I didn't know how surprise worked in fifth edition, but I, I think that those folks, you know, I don't, I don't think, I think the rules are too complex for any one person to hold all of it in their head. And I don't think they've been paying attention to the running the game videos. The running the game videos are not really about the rules of fifth edition. They're about how to be a dungeon master and good dungeon masters, I think can make a ruling. This is a classic, make a ruling on the fly. And if you're a good dungeon master, it will be a fair ruling and it will make sense. And I think the ruling I came up with in the moment was both of those the players accepted it. That's how you can usually tell when there's a problem is you make something up and the players are like, well, that's crap. That means I can't do my thing. You're like, oh, word, let me fix that. But in the moment it worked and we moved on and that is the goal is to keep things moving. Copper tries to use his keen eye ability, which is something that I gave the ranger in favor of uh, the favorite enemy because I wanted something that was a lot more interactive and uh, fun and mechanical. And keen eye allows the ranger, my ranger, to just, instead of moving, 
kind of get a bead on somebody, study them and watch how they move, watch how they act and find a weakness in their behavior and their fighting style and their strategy. He rolls and it's based on how powerful the creature is. So I used hit dice as part of the mechanism. So a very, very high level creature, it's, you're gonna have to roll really well uh, in order to beat. And Mortem is unfortunately a very high level wizard. So even though Tom rolled okay, I think his total was a 19. He's uh, that's It's eight plus the hit die. The hit die is way higher than like 11. Mortem is much greater than 11th level wizard. So Tom fails his keen eye roll, which is going to happen. It is That's the reason you make it a roll. It's not automatic. And Mortem is way too high level for it to work on him. But I kind of didn't have a good explanation for why it didn't work. I feel like I kind of flubbed that in the moment. And I think there is a good explanation. For one thing, he is not in combat. He's not doing, he's not, be, he's not exhibiting any behavior that would allow someone to figure out how, to, keen eye is about exploiting tactics, tactical failures, weaknesses in their thinking and planning in combat. Oh, he always leads with his right. And, and there's no combat. There's no fighting happens. So it's especially difficult in this scenario. I think that would have been a better explanation. Uh, so, but he does roll. I said, I gave him advantage because I figured, well, you've got surprise and he doesn't know you're there. So go ahead and roll 2d20. This is an instance where that is hugely useful because I wanted dramatically, I wanted Copper's first shot to go off and hit. And it does. The red arrow speeds toward his target. It hits Mortem. It appears to pierce his wards. It spins him around and it reveals, it reveals under his cloth what looks like it's this metal arm but the cloth appears to be dissolving and changing and the character is dissolving and changing and permuting and the players realize it's not his cloth that's tearing, it's his entire form that is altering and it's not Mortem. It's a brass dragonborn paladin, a dark knight, and I just announced who it was even though there was no way for the players, for the characters to know this. It's Mandrake the Betrayer, a former loyal member of Good King Omen's Dragon Phalanx. He was kind of the, before the campaign started, the good guy, hero king who died to set up my previous campaign. And he is Ajax's greatest warrior. And at this point, there's only been one action in the first round of combat and all hell breaks loose, literally. As the players are trying to figure out what does this mean, we were betrayed, we kind of knew going into this, the players knew we were going to be set up, but they didn't know exactly how it was going to play out and they were surprised to discover this wasn't Mortem, it was like Disguise Self or something like that, it was some spell hiding uh, Mandrake the Betrayer. I have, you know, uh, the Chrysopolis, the, uh, the City of Gold, which is what... Ajax calls his floating citadel. His floating citadel just suddenly arrives, and I describe it as blotting out the sun, right? The players, suddenly it gets dark like midnight, and the players are like, what? And that's when they discover the floating citadel is covering almost the entire city. Ajax has arrived, at least in form, if not in person, and from the Chrysopolis comes streaming hundreds of giant hawks with riders on their backs, and the players are like, oh, it's the hawk lords. The Hawk Lords are another group that Ajax mastered, and because they are Hawk Riders, they are basically his artillery. They can drop these massive, huge balls of iron and just completely devastate cities. The Hawk Lords start streaming out of the Chrysopolis, and then Ajax arrives literally in person. He is at, I put his miniature on the table. It's a custom uh, kit-bashed Warhammer miniature from our friend Blues Light Painting, and he looks like a golden god. He's got blonde hair, he's got blue eyes, he's he's in gold regalia. He does not look like a villain. He presents himself as a hero. He thinks that he's going to be the one that unites all the different regions of Orden and creates a new empire of man. Phil looks at the miniature and is like, does he have a jade hand? I'm like, yeah, he does have what appears to be a jade hand. At this point, I think many of the players were surprised. I don't think they thought they were going to meet Ajax the Invincible in the first session of the game. Ajax is floating, he's got these huge wings that slowly beat, giving him flight. When he speaks, his voice is supernaturally amplified so that everybody on this entire city block can hear him. And he looks down at the bishop and he says, Bishop Ives, I know you had nothing to do with this. I will spare your life. Your church, on the other hand, and the hawk lords fly over and they just obliterate this stone church. Huge pieces of masonry go flying around, smashing into other buildings, killing the people living in them. The hawk lords spare nobody. They start bombing the entire city. That, I think, surprised the players, is that their attempt to kill Ajax's wizards was going to wipe out Black Bottom effectively. Ajax says, rebellions are so tedious, but they must be taken seriously. Then Ajax says a word, he says, Relg, and this vortex, this hellish vortex of blasting heat and fire opens up like 30 feet over the ground, and you can smell brimstone, and you hear the howling of souls, and this giant fleshy monster goes 
bleh, and falls out of this portal. The portal closes up and there is this giant demon named Relg. Relg the Descendant, the Lord of Wretch, appears on the battlefield. He's massive and the player's like, is that really how big he is as a scale? I'm like, that is really how big he is. And summon creatures get to act and so I roll a d6 to see who is Relg going to grab. He has a grab attack and I assign one, two, three, four, five and I roll I roll behind the uh, behind the screen but I, and I decided in my head, I do this all the time, I didn't announce this to the players, I've, many of them have seen me do this before. I said, well, there's five of you, there's a six, I have a six out of die. I'll roll one, two, three, four, five, assign each of you and if I roll a six, I'll just re-roll it and I rolled a six and I just changed on the fly who I was going to attack and I just recounted one, two, three, four and I pointed to Lars and went, five, six. So this is this is, this is bad news for Lars, by the way, and he knows that. Uh, and we'll talk about what happened in a minute. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about everything from Lars's point of view in a second. Uh, you know, Relg grabs the commander, and he easily makes his attack roll. I think he hit an AC of 34. And I describe it as being like, it's not Relg physically grabbing the commander with his hand. It's the intestines. Relg has this, he's eating something. He's got this handful of bloody, smelly, intestines that he's munching on and chewing on and it's those he reaches his hand out and those intestines shoot out and wrap around the commander and lift him off the ground he's now grappled he uses he has a a, a damage when he grapples something automatically and it does like 40 some odd damage i think it's literally 40 damage to lars i critted on that attack by the way rail going got two attacks and he critted on both of them and that's one of those instances where i was rolling behind the scenes so i could make certain things happen if i needed to i could adjust die rolls and then a Astonishingly, I rolled I rolled two twenties and I was like, this is this sucks because I wish I'd done this in front of them. But if I'd done it in front of them, I might have rolled a one. And so this is part of the setup. This is part of the cinematic opening. So it wouldn't have mattered what I had rolled behind the screen, ultimately, because I would have just decided that Relg hit. This is part of the setup, you know, and the players had bought into that. They had bought into the idea that they were going to play through the fall of the chain. And the campaign was going to be them licking their wounds and building up to get revenge against the people that screwed them. So Relg's action is done. Relg got to go. Ajax was also holding his action. So Ajax goes. Ajax's action is to summon Relg. Relg, a summoned creature, gets to take his full turn. He grabs Lars. The grapple has a damage attached to it. He now has the commander lifted up. It's now the rest of the player's turn. And they get to spend an entire round of combat figuring out what they're going to do. And ultimately, there isn't really anything they can do. And some of them know this, especially like Lars knows this. There's nothing they can do. This is a cinematic setup. But also... Also, I think some of the players, especially like Anna and Tom, Tom, not Tom, Anna and Tom understood that this is our chance to show how do our characters react to what's happening. We know we're probably going to have to retreat. It said that in the campaign we chose, but how do we do that and how do we react to the commander apparently about to be killed? They take their actions. They think about what they can do. They're going to basically try to do a running battle, attack a relg, see if they can do anything, and run if the answer is no. So they're all setting themselves up to get an attack, and if it fails and nothing happens, split. And that is largely what starts to happen. But Judge has a great moment where Judge is like, what happens to creatures' souls if they're killed by relg? And uh, you know, Judge may have some insight because Judge is a tiefling and actually from another plane and knows a lot about... Uh, uh, demons and devils and I described well you know Lars for one thing knows listen if Matt kills my character you are 100% going to see my character as an evil NPC in the future it's his thing it's what he does <laughs> I refer you to the opening of the campaign where three NPCs that used to be PCs were the ones making the deal and I said to Anna that yeah I mean if Relg kills the commander Relg will have the commander's soul and that could mean a lot of things it could mean that Relg knows everything the commander knows and at that point, Judge is like, the commander has to die, and better by our hands than Relg's. But there isn't really a way for the players to do overwhelming damage. And this is Phil's turn. I think people watching were a little bit frustrated because Phil took a long time on his turn. But what he was trying to do was he was trying to balance my character would do something. My character would also, he would do something, he would try to stop Relg, he would try to at least get some damage in before he retreated. Then he needs to retreat, and how do I set that up? How do I position myself? So that's one level of complexity that Phil was dealing with. And then Anna put a whole other level of complexity on it, which is, can we kill the commander before we leave? And I think if Phil's could have, if Phil could have found a way to do that, 
I think in that moment he would have. But the Javelin of Lightning, that was another thing. His character had the Javelin of Lightning. The, it turns out the Javelin of Lightning just doesn't do enough damage to one-shot somebody, even with only four hit points, which is what the commander had at that point. So that took a long time, and I let it take a long time. I wasn't super worried about it. I think people watching thought it was tedious, but it was a super complex thing with many things layered on top of it. I want to do some damage. Sweet wouldn't just run, but also Sweet is a tactical person. He understands what's going on. We need, we're going to need to retreat. If the commander dies, we probably can't save him. Can I kill him? Can I save his soul? Literally, can I save the commander's soul? I think maybe I've got this magic item. It's pretty powerful. Let's figure out how powerful. Oh, 46 is actually a lot of damage. This is what's going on in Phil's head, and they're working this all out collectively, but oh, wait, I have to do this much damage in order to kill somebody, even with only four hit points? It's not going to work. And he says, well, I'm going to throw the javelin anyway, because that's what Sweet would do. He throws the javelin. It barely damages Relg at all. He, like, scratches his ass, because it hits him in the rear, and he's like, oh, I feel something poking at me. I love playing Relg. Relg is a lot of fun when he shows up. He's like, hello, boss. Well, that was the lieutenant's turn. Uh, the Javelin of Lightning didn't really do anything. It's the commander's turn. The commander wants to do something. He's got the red arrow. He knows it's not going to work against Rel. Relg's not a wizard. And he wants to save it for the company. Lars, 98% of Lars's thought during this process was, how do I stop the players from making dumb decisions? Because they don't understand the situation. They shouldn't try to save me. It's not going to work. They shouldn't use the Javelin of Lightning. That was the number one thing Lars was thinking about. If you watch the video and you see him being like, oh, uh, it's him trying to figure out how do I stop? I didn't realize this at the time. It's him trying to figure out how do I stop Phil from using the Javelin Lightning? How do I stop the player? Somebody else could die if they stick around. I order you guys to retreat. And there's a point where Judge brilliantly Anna improvs a line where he's like, Judge, I order you to get out of here. And Judge says, I don't take orders from dead men. Because Anna knows how this is going to go. Anna has no behind-the-scenes knowledge of what's going to happen. She's just reacting to what she sees. And judge of all people has seen crazy stuff like this happen before. Lars is really upset, deeply, deeply upset that no one's listening to him. That was the problem. Lars hates it when he's the one who gets to the end of the sentence before everybody else and realizes what the punctuation mark here is, and they're still reading along. And this is you're going to see this happen in the stream moving forward, is Lars is like, it's stupid for you guys to try. I'm going to die. This is, I know how Matt thinks. I know how Matt runs the game. He set this up to kill the commander. You guys got to get out of here. Listen to me. That's what was frustrating Lars. I know that because we talked about it afterwards. Being restrained technically doesn't stop you from being able to make attacks and stuff like that. You just can't move, which is, I think, a brilliant rule from 4th edition. A hundred times simpler than grappling in 3rd edition. So he's able to use his uh, bow or whatever or just throw the arrow. I think he shoots the arrow, but he doesn't, like, shoot it, shoot it. He, like, half shoots it so it falls next to Judge. And I'm like, you're not trying to hit Judge, so you don't have to worry about making an attack roll. And that way they save that red arrow. So they managed to save the red arrow. That worked. I had no idea how many red arrows they were going to use. And ho the whole point of allowing the players to play through this was it's only going to be one round of combat. It's not going to be a huge waste of time, but it also is going to be something they all remember. They are all going to remember, even though it was they didn't have a choice. They didn't have a chance. They didn't have a choice. There was no way to save the commander. They're all going to remember what they did in those moments. And I think if you watch the video and me talking to them afterwards, that 100% worked. A lot of people online were like, but you did a whole video about never put the players in a situation where they have no options. But the whole thing about being a dungeon master is knowing when to break the rules and being able to trust your friends and set things up. This was a setup. This was not a normal session of D&D. The advice I give about taking away players agency, I think is still good advice, but you can create these moments where you have player buy-in and you've talked to the players and they understand what's coming. And you're like, okay, this is a dramatic and interesting and valuable exception. So now one turn of combat has gone by. Ajax gets another action. Ajax and Relg both act at the same time. And I describe the fog in Black Bottom. The fog on the ground starts to swirl and twist. And the players are like, what crazy thing is Ajax doing? And behind Ajax is the center of the vortex. And the fog, the white fog, starts to coalesce in a whirlwind. This spinning fog, it's almost like a fabric. It's almost like cloth. And then it does become cloth. There is this figure in the vortex. And I put Lady Serial's mini on the board behind Ajax. And uh, Tom playing Copper was like, before he saw the mini, he was like, is it another mini? Is this not enough? Is this not enough, Matt? Do we need another monster? But he was like, oh, hey, look, it's Lady Serial. 
Standing behind Ajax and apparently unknown to Ajax, Lady Serial draws Orion, the Master Sword. This is a sword the players have seen before. The last time they met Lady Serial, she had Orion and she described it as the Master Sword. No other blade would dare attack her while she held it. And EJ, when she said that, didn't waste any time, didn't negotiate. He just attacked her with Wound, this magical two-handed black iron orc war axe. Lady Serial stabs Ajax in the back with Orion. And this is a little bit of a linguistic thing I deployed because in the back can also mean like behind you. So the players, I wanted them to imagine that she is about to kill Ajax the Invincible. And for a beat, they thought that she had hit him, but that's because only because the way I described it. And then I kind of went back in time and showed how Ajax steps out of the way and uses the Jade Hand to grab Orion by the blade. He turns and twists the jade hand and tries to force, just using Orion as a lever, tries to force Lady Serial to her knees. And he says, he has a line of dialogue where he says, your father kneeled to me and lived because he knew this is an age of men. But Lady Serial is not her father. Her father was a mortal elf and she is now an immortal vampire lord. And Ajax is unable, even with all his strength, even with the magic of the Jade Hand, is unable to force her to her knees. Bent but not broken, defiant even in defeat, Lady Serial draws another tooth of the dragon. Before she can stab Ajax with it, he clenches the Jade Hand and shatters Orion. Orion explodes with this opalescent energy. It's like somebody dropped a magical bomb on the city. And the players watch as Lady Serial's skin starts to flay and disintegrate. And she howls in pain and desperation, despair and frustration. And she blows away in the wind. She is now no more. The characters watch this expanding orb of magical energy fly out into the sky, and I describe the camera looking up at the blue sky and the this wave of energy washing out over the world, and then the camera pans down, and we're not in black bottom anymore. This is a cutscene trick that I have deployed a couple times before, and I think it worked pretty well this time. The players now realize they're watching a cutscene. The camera pans down, and there's a forest somewhere. They don't know where, and it's night. And as we zoom in, in the forest, lost it appears in the forest are these three carts and a bunch of carters. They're just peasants. These are perfectly mundane carts. And the camera continues to push in until we're inside the third cart. In the third cart is this recumbent woman. She's lying there. She appears sick. Like uh, in, a, in the modern day, we would describe her as like wasting away, like she has tuberculosis. She has gold skin and white hair and hourglasses for eyes. I think that was the language I used, but I think everybody understood I meant pupils. This woman appears to be a long time dying, and she has just seen, had a vision of something, and the last thing she says is, Serial, you bitch. And her eyes turn back to normal blue eyes, and her body ages a thousand years in a moment, and her last breath leaves her. And then, as if waking from a dream, another woman, this one much like Lady Serial, a human this time, but very pale skin, red lips, and bloodshot eyes, is sitting on what appears to be a very fine, almost like a throne in a mausoleum, this plush, ornate chair in this gray building. It's very cold in here. This is the dead lady who rules over a dead city. She's just had a dream, a vision of something. And she shakes it off for a second and says... Lady Zorgan, and this cloud of soot forms into a person in an instant in front of her, and there is this what appears to be this undead knight in black armor, another woman, and this person is filled with hate toward whatever power allows the dead lady to command her, and says, my lady, and the dead lady on her throne says, the game has begun. Bring me the book. And Lady Zorgan says, by your command, and turns to leave. Then the demon, Relg, in Black Bottom, kills the commander. This is a special attack Relg has that he can only use against a grappled person, and again, I rolled a critical. It wouldn't have mattered what I rolled behind the scenes. <laughs> we were just, the things are going to happen to facilitate the events that the players have all agreed to, but in, in this instance, I did happen to roll a 20. 
I describe Relg as I actually forgot. I forgot to describe in the moment how Relg killed the commander. And Lars was like, well, my character's dead because I did 68 damage to him when he only had like 12 hit points left. I asked Phil to give me his character sheet. And people, even at the table, started to understand what's happening. And I crossed off lieutenant and I wrote commander. And I said, you just got a field promotion. And, of course, people in chat, people in the in the days since that event, watching Lars play... Uh, they assumed that this that Lars was miserable. He had spent all this time making a character and we got art for it and he got to play. Not at all. Basically didn't get to play D and D at all. Didn't get to play this character at all. Do anything. And uh, that's a reasonable conclusion. But uh, then there were other people in the discord, for instance, in our subscriber only discord that I was looking at after the fact, it seemed like it was about 50, 50 in the discord. People were like, this is a setup. Lars was in on it. I mean, he's, he seems angry, but he doesn't seem anywhere near angry enough for, I just lost a character that I spent a year working on. And it got to the point where I had to actually write out, I had a conversation with Lars the next morning when he came in to work and I transcribed that conversation along with a, some snippets from lunch and uh, there's a Reddit post that I made uh, so you can read that conversation between me and Lars and I had Lars sit down here and read that and I said is this basically what happened and he was like yep uh, so it is approved by Lars and what you don't know what you're not so some people were saying it was a fix that Matt and Lars planned this and some people watching of course they don't they're for many people this is their first time watching my content and they were like uh, if that were me I would never I would have got up and, and left I would never play in a game like that and then there were even other people who were like this is not something a first time DM should do and Matt's the king of first time DMs uh, but the fact of the matter is that I had in you know we've talked about this session for over a year me and the other players in different combinations at lunch and at game night. And Lars is my best friend. And they, the players all, especially Lars and Phil talked about how Matt's going to kill somebody on the first night to, 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 to light a fire on everybody's butt and to make it dramatic and to give us a reason to hate the bad guys. And that notion grew at least among uh, Phil and Lars, especially to the point where they had convinced themselves it was going to happen. And there was definitely a point where Lars having not yet chosen his character, Lars was like, I bet he's going to kill me first because I'm the one who keeps making fun of what a dumb name Ajax the Invincible is. That's true. He does do that. Uh, I think Ajax is a fantastic name uh, because uh, I, I know it as something other than a soap. And so there was a point where Lars said, actually, that would be maybe I should play the commander because it would be pretty dramatic if the commander died in the first session. And so, so Lars says that, and this is like, I always think we were all still at Turtle Rock when he said that to give you, so this is way before the Kickstarter. And he says that, and I'm like, ooh, I'm right next to you. So in the moment, in the moment, it could have gone either way. I could have grabbed Lars or I could have grabbed Phil because they were both kind of talking about how dramatic it would be. And they knew my game. They both know me really well. And they both know my game really well. And they know how I like to do things. And they were both talking about it. But I had already killed Phil's character in an awful, awful scenario that I hated and made me unhappy. I wasn't going to do that to him again, even though there was a part of Phil that was like, that would be kind of funny. And But he made a character he really, really loved. Lars, as he was making his character, was like, well, my guy's going to die in the first round, so I'm not going to bother getting attached to this guy and he thought more about who the commander would be and he made kind of what I would say was a kind of a generic white dude battle master and he was saying he would say stuff like I want to give my guy the best chance possible before he dies and who would the commander be he would probably be a fighter battle master so that was what was in Lars's head so Lars instantly got what was happening when it was happening there was a huge setup was he in on it well I think the best way to describe it there's a point when you know somebody really well we're best friends and we've been talking about this for a long time where where the difference between is he in on the fix or was he not in on the fix is indecipherable. I think the best way to look at it is he was an unindicted co-conspirator. And the thing that frustrated him, you see Lars being very frustrated and Lars is a very stoic dude, right? He does not somebody who wears his emotions on his sleeve. The thing that frustrated him was the fact that he, and this happens with Lars a lot in my games, and it's because Lars has played a lot of Final Fantasy and he thinks tactically, and now he's played a lot of D&D. &D. He's been playing with me since fourth edition. And he knows me really well. He knows the kind of game I like to run where Lars often gets to the end of the sentence before everybody else does. And everyone else is sort of playing catch up. And Lars was frustrated because he was saying, leave me retreat. He was trying to have the commander. And I don't think he had planned this. I think he was trying to have the commander die in a dramatic way by saying, 
by ordering the retreat. And the other members of the office, were like, the other officers of the company were like, no, we're going to try and save you. Uh, and I thought that was pretty remarkable. A lot of people watching thought Lars was really unhappy. And uh, and he, I know him really well. He was not unhappy. He was frustrated because the other players weren't obeying his character's orders. And he wanted to save the javelin. The javelin was the best magic item they had. And Phil was going to throw it away. And Lars was using language like, we need to use the javelin in the real game, is the phrase he used. And that tells you a lot about how he was thinking. So it, so the, this is the postmortem on the campaign, on the first session. The lesson here is, and we'll do a whole video. That might be the running the game video we do next week if we can, if we have time to do a running the game video next week. Is that when you're doing something like a hot start, right? When you want to start your campaign with a bang, there's nothing wrong with going and talking to all your players or some of your players and say, I want to do something dramatic and pitching them in kind of vague general terms. Like you're going to see the fall of the chain, for instance, and the characters are going to have to retreat and go to capital, pitch them on that and see how they react to it. My players are really excited by that. And you can talk to them offline and sort of set up moments that the other players aren't in on. And that will make things happen incredibly dramatically. I trust my players and my players, especially Lars and Phil and Anna and Tom, and I think also Tom, they really trust me. So they knew if we just relax and play, what would our characters do? It's only going to be one round of combat before we retreat. And so that's the only time wasted. And I think everybody had a really good time. It was all they wanted to talk about after all for the next like 24 hours. We were all in chat. We all went to lunch. Everybody wanted to talk about the game and what happens next. So people saying this is bad D&D. This is you shouldn't do stuff like this. This is against all the advice Matt has given. Most of my advice is for new dungeon masters. And I hope folks understand. I am not a new dungeon master. I've done that. Not only am I not a new dungeon master, I have played with many of these players for years and they are some of my best friends. And in those situations, when you have built trust, you can do some cool and crazy stuff like create this really dramatic opening that all the players are going to remember. They're going to remember Ajax and what he looks like and what he said and his dialogue. They were quoting it back and forward to each other. So from my point of view, everyone had a really good time and it was a huge success. Many people were posting some variation of, if that were me, I would have left the table. But I think that hugely misses the point, because if you had been in Lars's seat, I wouldn't have done that. Because I don't know you. You're not my best friend. I would not have set you up like that. That would be ridiculous. So we talk about player agency, and that's super important to me. And this is one of those things where trust allows us to break those uh, rules. And I went to the players and told them, this is going to be a non-interactive, tragic cutscene. Are you guys okay with that? And they were excited by it. And they trusted that they could rely on me not to kill, for instance, Judge or Copper. who These are people that they had put a lot of work into their characters, and they really loved them. Or even like Nails is somebody that like Tom has never played before. I would never put him on the spot like that. But Lars, Lars is in a different situation and he knew what was coming and he had predicted a lot of things that were going to happen and was sort of looking forward to it. And he made a retainer. We'll talk about retainers now. He made a retainer that he was way more interested in playing. So retainers are something from Strongholds and Followers that I, we worked so retainers are something from Strongholds and Followers that we designed because I wanted to be able to give somebody who builds or buys or inherits a stronghold the opportunity to attract NPCs with class levels. Like I'm a fifth level, you know, uh, paladin and I attracted as somebody who pledged service to me shows up a third level ranger shows up. And the problem is though that in a scenario like that, people are going to want to sometimes take their, at their retainers into combat with them. I think mostly retainers are fun to use as lieutenants to have somebody in charge of your domain when you split and go on an adventure. But in, especially in a campaign where I might have a solo adventure with just one player, that player should be able to take their retainers with them on an adventure. And I was like, but running multiple characters is a huge pain in the butt. And we will do a whole uh, episode, a whole like a design diary on the different parts of Strongholds and Followers and talk about my design thinking there. A lot of it's written in the book. If you read the section on retainers, it explains why I made the decisions I made. The retainers have to be a lower level than their uh, than their leader. And these are all fifth level characters. So these are third level retainers. This was my idea for how to simulate the idea that the chain is this huge organization with many, many hundreds 
hundreds of regular soldiers, a small group of junior officers, and an even smaller adventuring party size group of senior officers. So who are those junior officers? Well, I figured charisma is typically the stat used for attracting followers and for leadership. So I just asked the different players, hey, use these rules because you can just pick them. You don't have to do any real work. You just go, oh, that looks cool. A skinwalker. They sound neat and all their abilities are already worked out for you. So go ahead and pick some retainers, a number of retainers based on your charisma modifier, which turned out to be like somebody had a four, somebody else had a four, and then one or two other people had a one and copper has no charisma. So that means there's like eight, there's like 10 retainers. There's 10 junior officers and they all came up with names that sound like names, nicknames that you would get in the chain, uh, which was a lot of fun. Like uh, Lars's retainer is named King for various reasons. And so far that's worked really well. The players didn't really complain about the fact that they didn't have these retainers with them in this combat. And the notion right now is that these guys are always going to be kind of like one encounter behind the other players because the goal is not to have 17 characters running around in one encounter. But when they get to capital, they will be able to do things like send their retainers off on missions or even switch and play their retainers as third level characters on an adventure while their fifth level characters are doing something else and kind of have a simultaneous kind of uh, uh, adventure. So the commander is dead. I remembered to describe what happened in Relg. I originally imagined that he was literally going to explode in a million pieces uh, with as all of these intestines wormed their way into his body and ripped him apart. But in the moment, having played Relg and having seen everyone's reaction to Relg, I decided that Relg would just literally rip the commander's head off and you would see the sinew and bone and skin ripping and tearing and popping off and that Relg would then squeeze the commander and drink his blood. I think that was pretty effective, especially with the Relg miniature sitting out there. You know, I'm on the book as saying that I love having really nicely painted miniatures, but I also think imagination is better in a lot of ways. Well, 100%, that Relg miniature painted by Blue's Light Painting is better than anything the players would have imagined. It was super evocative. And so me describing simple things, like with that Relg mini out there, it created this, you know, force multiplier and the players were like, oh, this is awful. I told Phil he was in charge. What was his first command? And he said, we're getting the hell out of Dodge. He had been saying that for a while. They all, re re they all knew this was going to be a retreat treat. So he said he didn't order. I, I was disappointed that he didn't actually, it was, it was Phil saying we need to get the hell out of Dodge. That's not a phrase that Sweet would use. Uh, I was expecting maybe something more kind of in character and dramatic, but I know that Phil, I have now played with Phil as a dungeon master, by the way, and Phil as a dungeon master is an amazing role player. He does all sorts of different voices. He changes the shape of his body and stuff like that. But Phil, when he's at the table, I think he feels he doesn't want to act out, right? He doesn't want to, he wants to just be kind of in the background, part of the group, one of the guys having fun. And it's going to take him a while. It's going to take everybody a while to kind of get into character. But I definitely feel like uh, Anna and Tom and Tom were all having a lot of fun role playing. I enjoyed watching Tom role playing Copper when uh, the commander, Lars asked a question. This is brilliant, by the way. This is some next level D&D play as far as I'm concerned. Next level dungeon mastering even, I think. Lars asked a question out of character. How the hell did you get a displacer beast? And Tom answered in character. He goes like, what do you mean? I'm the best ranger ever, man. Best monster tamer. What do you mean? Right? That's that's his character. That's Copper speaking. And I recognized, and I was like, I don't even think Lars knows that this is Tom role-playing. So they call the retreat, and Phil's like, well, what's in that direction? Where are the docks? And I'm like, the docks are in that direction. He's like, we're getting out of here. We're going to the docks. We're going to get on a boat, because he knows they have to go to Capital, right? But also, the characters know that Capital, if you're going to retreat from Ajax, Capital is the place to retreat to, because it's the most powerful city on the planet, and it's also the last thing on Ajax's path, so the last place he'll get to. And now it's a skill challenge, and you, I link below to my rules for the skill challenge. They were just basically notes. I'm a big fan of skill challenges. And of course, the players, having not played a lot of fourth edition, I have not encountered a lot of skill challenges. And so I wanted to take it easy on it. It was a pretty simple skill challenge, but they did well. It wasn't, it was simple in the sense of it wasn't going to be hard for them to succeed. But I, I figured they might get one or two. They might make it to the docks with one or two failures. I told them the challenge isn't can we make it to the docks or not? The challenge is can we make it to the docks ahead of this army of demons that is rising up in the city and tearing everything apart because depending on how many failures they get there could be an encounter and could be a very nasty encounter between them and the docks but they did a pretty good job uh the dcs weren't very high no one tried to do anything really weird the way, one of the things i like to do with uh skill challenges is if you come up with something if you say how can i use arcana to do this i might to get to the docks i might just say i can't think of any way i can't think of any way you'd be able to do that can you 
And if the player comes up with something that is that seems even remotely plausible to me, I'll give him a shot, but I'll set the DC really high. And that reflects the idea that this is a really obscure use of this skill to try to do this. I'm not going to say no if they came up with a decent reason, but that doesn't mean the DC is going to be 13. It might be 16 or 17. But the players all came up with relatively straightforward things to do, and I helped them a lot. You can see this. They were like, can I use this skill somehow? And I said, well, you might use this skill to do this. I'd already written some notes that you'll see. And they're like, oh, yeah, that sounds good. And they still feel like it's them doing it. It's them making the roles and they all succeeded no they actually rolled pretty well but i'm intend on using more skill challenges in the future and ideally the players will start being the ones and i've seen this work before in other campaigns with other players uh the players will be the ones that start coming up with ideas for how to use their skills rather than just waiting for me to give them ideas so the city guard are closing the gates, trying to stem the tide of these demons, and they get to a closed gate, and Sweet, with his, you know, he's a pugilist with a belt of hill giant strength, just punches. He makes the skill check, an athletics check, and he knocks it out of the park. So he describes just punching the gate and having the gate explode into a million pieces. I love that. So that was one success. You know, Copper sees an entrance into the sewers, and he's a goblin. He's like, let's use the sewers. Let's get out here. That worked great. So it's this running battle to the docks, and they manage to get the docks, and Boots, who is one of Tom's retainers. So this is another character, a junior officer. Boots says, I know somebody at the docks. I know somebody who has a boat. Uh, they'll be able to get us out of here. Obviously, this is work I had done as prep work before the game. I just let Tom know, hey, just FYI, your character Boots knows the captain. Knows, knows. You know, Boots is a very charismatic, swashbuckling character. Your character Boots knows the captain of the Rosso Cielo, which is this big galleon. And you can probably count on that captain to help you out. I didn't give Tom any other information other than that. And as the events played out, he realized, oh, oh, I, I, this is my time. I need to do this. That was a little bit probably not the done thing. Looking back on it, Tom did a great job, by the way. But I think Tom was a little confused by the order of operations because now we're out of combat and he's able to kind of switch if he wants to between nails and boots. Uh, and people watching, I think, might have been a little bit confused. So it was probably, I probably should have picked maybe a different retainer than a retainer, which is a new mechanic that Tom, who's a new player who's never played D&D before, didn't know anything about. But if you watch the stream, he did a great job. He had a lot of fun role-playing boots. If something happens to nails, boots might be his next character. I think everyone's retainers, like Anna and Phil and Tom, all told me that they loved their re new retainers because they had all made characters a long time ago and they'd been kind of, I, I think they had kind of cooled on the excitement of playing these characters because it'd been a year in some cases since they made them. But the retainers, they just made like a week or two ago and they were really excited to play those guys. So they get to the docks, they get to the Rosso Cielo, which is this huge Rio and Galleon. Rosso Cielo means red sky. And it's like, at this point, it's maybe 6.30 in the morning, maybe 7 o'clock, depending on how long it took to run across the city. So Boots runs up the gangplank and is stopped by Godesto, the first mate. And I love role-playing Rioans. It was a lot of fun. And it was able, I was very quickly able to get into who Godesto was. And he's like, he recognizes Boots. And he's like, oh no, not you. And between Boots and Judge, who follows hard on the heels of Boots and Judge, has a forked tongue, which allows a Judge to, this is an ill rigor ability because they are knights of hell. They are able to uh, double their proficiency bonus when using like Intimidate, Deception, and something else. I think I've changed it since then based on feedback so that Anna's going to have to pick one. You know, choose one of these. You get to double your proficiency modifier when using skills based on this because that also is, there's not really a reason to have all three be available at once. Uh, there are very few scenarios where you would want to use all three. It's pretty overpowered. And also, it allows different ill riggers to be more different, a lot more specialization. So between Boots knowing these characters and Judge and his forked tongue, they're able to charm their way and start negotiating with the captain, Lady Massingham, who owns this. She is a Vaslorian, and she's a, she, I described her as being like six feet tall. She's a big lady. She's wide. She's got a, like a tri-corner hat. She looks kind of like a classic captain, and she's got like this bleached, maybe once red, but now bleached strawberry blonde straw hair sticking out from underneath her hat, big red cheeks with freckles. And she is, you know, she's not a pirate per se, but she is the captain of an adventurous galleon full of Rioans. So she's been around the world and she knows and she likes boosts and she's very interested in who this uh, demonic looking but really, really handsome and very charismatic knight is. But they're trying to commandeer her boat and there's two things happening here. One, it's her boat. 
She's like, this ship goes where I want it to. Uh, and and I don't want to necessarily get in league with the chain. What the heck is going on? Are you guys responsible for everything that's happening in the city right now? And also, there's things about the boat that uh, Lady Massingham knows that the chain doesn't know. And she kind of tried to say, you don't know what you're dealing with or you don't know who you're dealing with. And they just like, they didn't say anything. They didn't ask any questions because they had to get on the boat. And I describe this flood of people, citizens, trying to escape the decimation of the city, trying to escape the Hawk Lords and Ajax and the demons, and they're going to run, they're going to storm the Rosso Cielo, and immediately everybody, like especially Phil, is like, no, that is not happening. Copper, can you do something about this? And Tom, playing Copper on Big Cat's like, yeah, I'll see if I can do something. And I'm like, all right, Tom, how are you going to stop these people from storming the Rosso Cielo and just swarming all over it? And Tom's like, I'm on a displacer beast, man. And I was like, Oh, right. So it's very easy for him to just kind of have a display and have these people just stop. All the citizens stop when they see this giant displacer beast with a goblin on it, you know, uh, displaying its tentacles to them, a six legged uh, panther thing. And they just like, there's another boat over there. And they run to the other boat, right? They're just going to follow. It's like water is how I describe them. They're just going to follow the path of least resistance. The players charm and negotiate their way onto the Rossos Yellow. It involves the treasury to a certain extent. And some amount of money is going to have to uh, go back and forth. But given the emergency scenario, Lady Massingham is willing to defer the negotiations until once they're underway. It being understood among all parties that some amount of money is going to have to change hands. The Rossos Yellow unfurls its sails, and of course in real life there'd be no way for a galleon to move this quickly, but dramatically it starts pulling away. They've weighed anchor, they start pulling away from the docks. They were loading cargo, and they were in the middle of doing that. I'm like, this is going to take a while to load this cargo. Are you, what are you guys going to do? Are you going to wait for the cargo to be loaded? And they never asked, who, the, who does this cargo belong to? Or what is this cargo? But they wanted to get out of Dodge, as Phil said, as quickly as possible. And they're not going to wait for the cargo to be loaded. And I was sort of imagining they were just going to, like, use their weapons or something to cut off the ropes and pulleys that are lifting this giant crane. But instead, Phil, with his belt of hill giant strength, which is a perfectly legitimate fifth level item for these characters to have, just starts grabbing the rope and pulling this thing like he's, you know, like he's Hercules. I thought that was super dramatic, a lot of fun. I just loved running for these guys. It was so much fun. It was so much fun for me to be running for my friends again these guys these guys who i played with before phil who i love having as a player and just seeing them all spontaneously role playing their characters and kind of gelling as a group i really i was incredibly surprised at how much role playing they were able to do having never played together with these characters before these crates of cargo all wrapped in netting drop onto the deck the rossos yellow starts pulling away from the harbor from the docks and starts heading out to see all these other ships big ships little ships are all trying to get away from the city and escape the carnage and as they are leaving black bottom behind they see this figure which is you know a thousand feet away this this uh, black clad flying human start casting this battle magic like epic magic that normal players don't have access to starts casting fireballs i had to i made that up because the range of fireballs probably not enough to do this given i wanted to make sure that mortem that's who this was finally they meet mortem that mortem was out of range of anything the heroes might try to do he starts fireballing one of the three big galleons that's trying to escape and the this ship just you know it lights on fire and sinks now there's only two of the big three masters left trying to get away the rossos yellow and another ship that captain massingham is familiar with the sparrow and she's like watch the sparrow we should be faster than her we should get away if and she's kind of thinking uh they'll go after the sparrow before they come after us and so everyone's watching to see what happens to this other galleon and as it looks like it's going to escape these giant tentacles come out from the water uh, ajax or mortem or someone in league with them controls demons and creatures of the deep and these tentacles there's more than six of them more than eight of them i don't remember how many i said there were dozens of tentacles reach up over the sparrow and all of the sailors on the sparrow are hacking at the arms they're desperately trying to do something and then the tentacles all start to clench and they snap the sparrow in two and drag her underwater leaving the Rosso Cielo the only ship that they can see that managed to escape the destruction of Black Bottom. The chain have commandeered the Rosso Cielo. They have escaped the betrayal at Black Bottom that left them without their commander and Lieutenant Sweet in charge. And the captain turns to Lieutenant Sweet and says, you really know how to make things difficult for me. And then the last thing that happened, and I didn't know where the first session was going to end. There were many beats, including some after these, that I thought the players might get to. But the last thing that happened was this half 
half-orc in full soldier regalia is like an officer. This half-orc emerges from below decks and other orcs are coming out with him. They're all war breed. And he looks at the chain on the deck of the Rosso Cielo and he points to Captain Massingham and says, turn this ship around. And he and all of his troops are all wearing the regalia of Ajax the Invincible. These are all soldiers in Ajax's army. That's who was on this ship. That's who that cargo belongs to. And we're going to pick up next week and find out what happens when the soldiers, the soldiers, some of some of his best soldiers find out that they're on the ship with the mercenaries that just tried to kill Mortem, Mandrake and Ajax. That was the first campaign diary, folks. A lot of stuff happened. It was, I think, a pretty successful setup, a pretty successful session. I'm mostly concerned with whether or not my players are having fun. They seemed like they were having a blast. It's all they wanted to talk about. Then I said, we're still talking about it. It is currently Friday. It's been two days and everyone's still talking about it. Phil is now responsible for picking the new lieutenant. And it is something he has spent a lot of time thinking about. He's texting me all the time about who's most loyal to the chain. And I was like, you know, what would Sweet do? You know, forget about what Phil would do. What would Sweet do? And so there's a lot of back and forth about who he thinks would be the best lieutenant and it's a really interesting discussion the reaction from the people watching from the community in the days afterwards has been literally overwhelming i was crying on the way home because people just seemed to want to celebrate what we had done and i was amazed that we pulled it off we played DD, we had fun i ran exactly the game that I would have run if there had been no one watching. And uh, in fact, it's, by the way, I think I mentioned this before, I ran this same exact setup at Pandemic. There are people probably watching this video right now, like my friend Jordy, Wallace, Jeff, Lara, who played in this game and the same thing happened. And so I knew it could be done. And I thought it would be fun to start a new game in this kind of hot start way. And we'll talk about how to do a hot start uh, maybe in the next video. But I also thought it would be an incredibly dramatic way to open the stream. And I didn't know which campaign the players were going to pick from the four I put in front of them, but they picked the one that I think is the most cinematic. And so why not have this awesome, epic, cinematic opening that might also engage an audience? And there were things, a lot of stuff went well. We did a poll in the middle of the episode because I wanted the people watching to feel like they were engaged. And the poll basically, it worked and didn't work because people definitely wanted to vote. They thought it was awesome that they got to play the citizens of Black Bottom. We're going to do this more in the future, maybe even in the next Next episode, maybe not every episode, maybe not every session, but they were going to get to play this, the citizens of Black Bottom. And I asked them, how do you guys respond? How do the citizens of Black Bottom respond to what's happening? I gave them three options and each one of those options I knew, but they didn't had a mechanical result regarding successes and failures in the skill challenge. So that worked hugely and people loved that. Everybody loved that. I loved it. I thought it was super neat because I didn't know how is the city going to react. And I love those moments where I don't know what's going to happen. It didn't work in the sense that the people in chat didn't realize that just saying something in chat didn't matter. You had to actually click on this poll. And of course, with 11,000 people watching, the the link just went past. And and so only like 170 people voted, right? So that's something we're going to work on. We're going to work on making sure that when we do stuff like this, when we engage chat, that people can get to the poll because I think it's super fun. I also, we had moderators in a a private discord. Our moderators who are monitoring chat were able to tell me the things chat were saying. And I love that. It worked super well. But the problem is I... For some reason, we discovered in the hours or the day before the stream, I'm not getting Discord alerts on my phone. And so what I was hoping was I would just be able to run D&D and every once in a while, my phone would go beep and I would look and be able to relay what chat was saying to me. So someone in chat, someone in Twitch chat says something funny, a moderator sees it and relays it to me. And that way I don't have to be monitoring Twitch chat. But people in chat get to see us react to what they're saying. In principle, it's a good idea. In execution, I thought it worked great. The problem was specifically this execution of it. I had to have an iPad mini open all the time and constantly be scanning it because I wasn't getting alerts. That was a problem. And there were people watching who said, this sucks because, yeah, what interacting with chat, whatever, Matt is distracted and he's constantly having to have the players repeat the things they say. Well, Yes, and I want to fix that, and I want to do better, but I believe in it in principle. I believe in that chat interaction in principle, and I think we have a good system set up for it. We just got to make it so the alert system actually works. But also, I am often a distracted DM when I'm behind the screen, especially during certain points of the game when the players are all talking about their plan, and I'm no longer able to keep track of what are they actually going to do, which of these things are the actual plan. And so what I will often do is I will be looking things up, I'll be taking notes, I'll be looking up rules or writing stuff down, and then I will just ask them to repeat what they said because that forces them to kind of co 
coordinate the uh, the mess of ideas they've had and present them to me. So I'm often a distracted DM, but I want to do better with that. And there's a lot of stuff that people were like, it was pretty hard to watch Phil spend half an hour taking his turn. Well, that's a problem you've had in D&D before. But in this specific instance, Phil was taking so long because this was a hugely important moment. Am I going to use our, our next best magic item, the Javelin of Lightning, to try and kill the commander? So that is the kind of thing that would take a long time. But one of the things I've done before is I've put timers out. And I don't usually don't have to flip them over. Just having the timers there kind of reminds everybody, right, 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 right. And I will do things like say, listen, it's time for you to decide. It, otherwise, your character stands there gobsmacked, right? And the players usually play along with that. So I think we can do better with chat integration and me being distracted. I think we can do better with some people taking really long turns. But also, I'm pretty forgiving with that stuff in certain moments. And this was probably a pretty good one for that. A lot of people were surprised to discover that I was not running a beginner game, that I was running quite an advanced game. I was pulling out every trick I knew from 30 years of being a dungeon master. And I think they were disappointed and there was a tonal mismatch that this was not a starter game for starter players from the guy who wants to make more starter DMs. However, I will tell you, you are going to get to see that game. We've been playing D&D with three people that have never played before. We've played four sessions so far. We've recorded all of them. We call it OD&D, meaning D&D for Matt O'Driscoll. OD is his nickname. And it's been a lot of fun. It's been a blast. And it is super chill and relaxed and very starter starter players. Super relatable, I think. Easy for people to engage with as a DM. As somebody who wants to DM, you'll be able to watch OD&D and go, oh, I, I can do that. The chain is very much kind of like, I think, advanced stuff. And I, I do. The reason I said I want to stream is because I want people to go, oh, I could do that. And so that's kind of a mis that was my fault is saying, I want you to be able to see that you can do this. That's true. I do want you to see that. But for me, the opening of the chain, especially with these players that I played with before, I wanted to do something kind of next level. And I thought it will also engage an audience. And I think it did, and I stand by that decision. But if you want to see the starter game that is very simple, first-level characters on a typical first-level adventure, and all the fun and kind of crazy stuff that happens, we will start uploading that probably in about three weeks. So that's it. That's the session. That's the first campaign diary. Um, it's been a long time since I've done one of these, so I'll probably watch it back and be like, oh, I could have done it better, could have done it faster. But you can go watch the uh, stream. It was a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to doing more of these. I can't wait to see what happens next. I can't wait to see who uh, Phil picks to be the lieutenant. He was asking a question about how the roll cards worked, right? Can can the staff sorcerer also be the lieutenant? I'm like, absolutely. You can have more than one rank, but during a long rest, you have to pick which one you're going to be using the next day. A lot of people had questions about the Illrigger class I made up in my tweaks to the Ranger, and that's they should have questions about it. I just want everybody to understand this is literally never tested draft zero stuff, right? I put a lot of work into the Illrigger and a lot of design into it, but it definitely needs to be tweaked, right? Of course it does. Literally no one has ever played it before. It has never been play tested. Same thing with the Beastmaster. So people have these reactions to some of the abilities. They're like their hats flip as though this was some kind of official product. It's it's not even an official MCDM product yet. Like Strongholds and Followers got months of playtesting, several rounds of playtesting. And even then, I was aware we're still going to have to tweak things once it comes out. And thousands of people are working on it and using it and reading it rather than just many hundreds of people. And that is true. We've revised it already three times. And every time, fewer and fewer people have anything to complain about. So the process is working. The process of revising the Illrigger and the Monster Tamer is what we're calling it. It hasn't even really begun, but it will. And I'm convinced we'll get there. And I think most people, when they look at something like the Illrigger, they go, I get it. It needs work, but I get it. And I'm here to tell you it will get that work. That's going to be part of the fun of Anna playing the character. I could instantly tell when she was asking about how Forked Tongue worked that I needed to tweak it a little bit and say, you have to be proficient in it. And you can only pick, you know, pick one instead of having all three. That's it, folks. Thanks for watching this first campaign diary, first session. The audience the people watching were so engaged. They seemed to have so much fun watching. They seemed to engage with the characters and they seemed to like the players in a way that I honestly, honestly, honestly never imagined would be possible. Um, and it remains to be seen what happens in three, four, five, six weeks from now. Obviously, we had a super dramatic opening. We're not going to be able to maintain that level of, oh my God. But that's not what D&D is about. D&D has ebb and flow and setup and payoff and stuff like that. And so we still have a lot of stuff to do before we get to capital. 
I still have live streams on Saturday mornings. We still have work to do before they get to Capital. One or two more live streams, I think at least, before they get to Capital. We'll probably focus on the docks next because that's where they're going to arrive. And they'll probably have an entire adventure, probably multi-session adventure just on the docks before they ever get into the city proper. And that'll give us even more time to get the rest of the city ready. From the command center at MCDM, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Thanks for putting up with all of my nonsense. Until next time, peace out.